right, we have to start the select board meeting for August 23rd, 2021. Um, Starting with the approval of the agenda, I'm not sure if there's any changes or additional additions. I'd like to add um, an errors and errors in the letter. To approve the agenda with the added errors and omissions letter. We had one more thing. That's why I'm a little bit late. Um, in there's been a couple of incidents down by the reservoir of people being attacked, and if we could bring that as a agenda item. Attacked by what? What? Attacked by. People. One. Well, one was I got a. Um, we can talk. We can talk about it. We can talk about it. Okay. So I'll put that on our select board. Uh, e for the reservoir. So I'll amend my mo motion and include Mike's request for discussion about reservoir okay. there a second. problems. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items, minutes from August 2nd meeting. Move to approve the consent agenda items. Okay, is there a second? Second. I move to the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Public. Um, I don't see, I see Danny joined us. Anyone from the public that wishes to speak can do so at this time. If not, um, if you want to speak on specific issues on the agenda, um, you can speak to them when we call upon you on those items. So I don't think I see anyone from the public that wants to speak tonight. So we can move on to select board business. Um, hey, COVID update, recreation camp outbreak and discuss masking policy. So um, we haven't met since we had the outbreak yet. Camp. I think we met on August 2nd, and then I believe it was maybe um, the next day. Um, maybe it was the week after, I can't remember. Anyway, um, we did have a COVID outbreak at the summer recreation camp. Um, it impacted, we had two pods of uh, campers, one at the Anderson Field, one at the Methodist Church, and one at uh, St. Leo's Hall. And it was the St. Leo's Hall pod where the outbreak was. Those were the younger kids. And uh, we had a couple of kids that tested positive on Monday. We found out that they tested positive on Monday. Nick immediately contacted the health department and the health department uh, started the process of uh, contact tracing and trying to, you know, uh, alert people about what was happening. Um, if you've paid attention to the papers at all uh, and some of the news, um, we were a little frustrated that things didn't go as smoothly with the health department as we had hoped. Initially, they, they identified uh, three children, and they asked us to close the camp on Tuesday at St. Leo's Hall. They told us the other venues could continue to operate. So uh, Nick and his staff spent that, uh, that day uh, trying to communicate with parents to let them know that they, they could not come on, uh, on Tuesday and suggested to parents that they think about getting their children tested. Uh, on Tuesday, the health department contacted us and told us that we could reopen fully on Wednesday, and we did. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, the case count continued to, to rise. And anecdotally, we were hearing that um, there were people that 
folks who had children who had tested positive had uh, given their information to the state health department about people that they had been in contact with over the previous few days. Um, and admittedly, self-admittedly, I spoke to Mike Smith, the uh, Secretary of Human Services, uh, back a week plus ago now. And uh, they unfortunately, I won't say dropped the ball, but they did not do a thorough job with contact tracing. And ultimately, I think that and some other factors played into the fact that we ended up uh, several days later being told by the health department that we had to shut down the entire camp for anybody who had been attending anywhere in the camp for that, that particular week. So the last week of camp, uh, we basically had 20 kids that uh, were able to come to camp because they had been away the previous week. Uh, people go on vacation, what have you. Any, any child who had not been at camp the week that the COVID virus was uh, detected was able to come back. But I don't have a final count now, but um, we made the decision internally that because of these external forces that uh, required children to, that we had to cancel, uh, we're in the process of processing refunds. Uh, we've done it on a pro rata basis, the number of days. Uh, so um, Carla's going to be busy signing checks, I think. I was this morning. Uh, I don't know if you know how many there were, but there were a lot of refunds. Uh, so we only had about 20 children who were able to finish up the camp. And we had to refund some money because, of course, the state told us that we had to shut down. It wasn't the, the individuals who just decided not to send their children. So I felt it was unfair to, uh, to not give money back for that lost week. Uh, some children may have lost a little bit more than a week if they had been uh, out the first week that COVID was detected. Ultimately, there were 31 cases uh, that were attributable to the camp. Uh, it seems that it was uh, limited just to children. There's not a lot of evidence that there's been a lot of spread amongst other family members. Uh, I'm not saying that definitively, but the information that I have is most of the cases that uh, were related to the camp were limited to, to campers and they didn't necessarily affect other uh, members of their households or other individuals. Um, the Watery Roundabout has done an excellent job, I think, uh, reporting on this. If you uh, read what was posted uh, yesterday or today, they have a pretty good article about it. Um, the staff did an excellent job, I think. Uh, we only heard good things from the parents about our response. Uh, there was some frustration expressed in the beginning because why hasn't so-and-so been called by the health department? We told them that our children had been in contact with these people and it didn't seem like contract, contact tracing was happening as efficiently as possible. So um, Mike Smith, I don't think it's necessary at this point, but the secretary did suggest that if the select board felt compelled that he would be willing to come here uh, and talk to the board about this issue. I, I told him that by the time you know, we meet again, um, camp will be closed. Um, I'm not certain we're going to gain a lot. Uh, I don't think he's going to tell you much more than I've just been able to tell you. but. Uh, um, you know, Watery has, in addition to the 31 cases in the recent week or so from the, from the camp, there's been about 23 or 24, I think 55 is the total number of cases in Watery since the middle of August when this outbreak occurred, which according to the roundabout is kind of the fastest rate of increase 
you know, goes back to the early part of the pandemic. Um, and as you hear on the news, um, this is not limited to water. I, I haven't heard of other recreation programs that have had this happen, but uh, cases are upticking in, in many places. And uh, it's, it's too bad, but I, I just wanted to give you that briefing to tell you what kind of had happened here. And I think, you know, Nick especially was disappointed. I won't share names, but I did share with the Secretary Smith. You know, some people at the health department were extremely helpful. There were others who, uh, it was like pulling teeth getting information from our staff. So uh, it was a little bit of a mixed bag of results and efficiency from the health department. Um, so anyway, that's all I have to say. I don't think I'll be able to answer too many questions, but if you have any, I'll try. Just a couple of quick, real quick questions. Um, do you know how much was in terms of refunds? You know, the refunds are totally justified, but do you know how much that we... Uh, I, I don't know right now, Mike. I didn't... Okay. Uh, Michelle was processing them today. I didn't think to ask. Um, you know, it's... I don't, I don't know. And are all the counselors, I assume, are they going to get paid for the full amount? Oh, yeah. They, they can see the okay. work. Uh, you know, they have, they have 20 kids. The pool remains open, so we right. did have full staff. Um, and then, you know, the, the day camp stopped. Uh, you just look at some refunds. That's like pages of them. Yeah. The day camp stopped the week before last, but last week they had a hunting and fishing camp, you know, for a smaller number of kids that had mm -hmm. signed up. That was able to go on. Uh, and then uh, I think in after school, there's a, uh, we'll have an after school program. Now our school is starting up that, you know, Nick was able to work with some staff and we've been able to, to implement that and have that available. I don't have a number right now. Nick's uh, not, not feeling well, otherwise he would be here, so. Nick, Nick did a good job on, you know, on his little piece on TV. Yeah, he did, he yeah. did extraordinarily well, I think. He really took the bull by the horns and was a good public face. Yeah. He answered a lot of questions, had some good interaction with the media. So I think uh, we're all happy, and I know Lisa's on, and I appreciate all of the information and how vigilant, you know, Lisa's been trying to get good information and, you know, as a good reporter, she has better contacts at the health department than I have and I got some information from her which was quite helpful. But, uh, yeah, Nick did a really good job and, and so did the rest of the staff. Right, you, you hate to make the news and something like that. Maybe. Yeah, it's not fun, but it happens and with this thing, it's. You know, it's almost inevitable. I'd be curious to know the uh, degree of uh, immunity that these kids have now that they've had it. You know, what are the, what are the percentage of them getting again? And school starts up next week. Thursday. Thursday. Thursday this week. Yeah. Is there any concern that we've heard? of school starting with possibly these cases still? There, there's, there's concern being expressed by some parents that I've just seen, you know, on posts on front porch forum and other media outlets. Uh, you know, the school has a protocol in place. They've been working closely with the Secretary of Education and the Governor's Office and Dr. Levine in the Health Department. I believe they're going to have to be masked. Uh, when they start this week. And um, I know in the upper grades they're talking about when those schools reach 80% of vaccinations, they may relax that a little bit. But I think there's a lot changing right now because of the Delta variant in particular. There seems to be a strong commitment in the state to uh, you know, have five day a week in person schooling. And uh, I think going to remote learning is going to be at a last resort. I think that cases are going to have to grow up wildly for them to do that again. Any questions? I don't think we have any. Anyone
one from the public. I see we got a couple people in there. Any questions before uh, we move on to discussing the masking policy? Yeah, I, want, I just want to say that I think the whole town crew did a great job in Nick, especially managing this. I can't imagine how many people were coming from every direction. So please extend our thanks to Nick. Um, masking policy. This is requested by Mike to be on the agenda. Yeah. So I'll let him take the So lead. one quick thing, um, Lisa sent the link to her most recent article on the on the COVID outbreak and then the school Q and A is happening right now. Okay. We'll post it online later. Thank you, Lisa. I just want to at least bring it up. I know it's starting to come up in other municipalities again about masking and just even just have a discussion about, you know, should we go back to, you know, if, if anything, indoor masking, I don't think, you know, outdoor masking, you know, but it's not required. It's just something I just thought would be good for discussion. I know some municipalities, I think Montpelier has gone to an indoor masking policy. Um, I'm sure there will be others. I know there, are, as you know, we're seeing we're in, I think the fourth wave, uh, things are gonna get worse. You know, I've been hearing from some members of the public that they think it's a good idea because we're gonna have a swarm of um, influx of people coming for uh, foliage. You know, do we want to, you know, so when you're talking about an indoor masking policy, are you talking about putting back the, the rather informal mask mandate that we had for all? You're not talking right. just about municipal facilities. You're talking about right. universally in what? Right, I just universally. Clear. And I don't know. I've been hearing buzz around the community that there's some tolerance for that. You know. I see more people around the community masking again. You know, you go into Shaw's, you see a lot more people, you know, you know, you know, masking. I just thought it would be good to raise raise the topic. I I have mixed very mixed opinions on whether it's a good thing, but I think it's something we should at least approach. Again, I don't mean to lean on Lisa, and I don't know if she knows. I, I wasn't able to, I didn't have a chance to look for it today, Mike, I was away last week. Um, at some point in the recent past, I, I don't know if I was reading a story about Brattleboro, but I thought there was, um, I thought there was something that said, because the state of emergency has expired Expire. now, that if municipalities want to have a mask mandate, that you have to have that blessed by the health department. And so I don't know if we have the authority to, to do it on our own. And uh, again, I don't know, Lisa, if you saw that story or know what I'm talking about, but if you have any information, you can share it. I, I was hoping to look to try to find that today, but um, I thought that they said that they were going to have to reach out to the health department to get approval to do that. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, the governor has been unwilling to do it statewide. Right. Um, so I'm not I'm not arguing against it. I'm just wondering, you know, if um, businesses certainly can do it on their own if they want. Right. Um, the library has instituted uh, anybody that goes into the library they, they want people to wear masks in the library. Um, we have a sign up on the door here that if you're unvaccinated that you need to wear a mask. And for the most part, Carol, you can correct me if I'm wrong because I was away last week, but pretty much the staff out in the front are wearing masks, especially when they're a public in the That's, yeah, primarily for our own comfort level and for those that have children at home. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking at, did, did Montpelier have to get <coughs> Like for instance, the health department's blessing. We, we don't know. Like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm asking maybe Lisa. Uh, so. uh, Bill, I, hi folks. Um, I did. I saw that story. The Brattleboro reformer had a story late last week 
um, about that. And that was the one thing that stuck with me too, because I had not heard that previously, that, that there needs to be some sort of sanctioning by the health department if a community was going to do that. Um, the city of Burlington is talking about the same, and I hadn't heard it discussed in that context. So that's actually one of the questions that I have for them. I was hoping to be on the um, press conference tomorrow, and that was one of the things I, I wanted to ask. So, so at this point, given that you're right, given the fact that there's no state of emergency, um, towns and municipalities are on their own. Um, but I had not heard about that extra step being put in between. Yeah. Um, and as a result, we end up with this hodgepodge of you know businesses kind of all doing their own their own recommendations. Right. Well, that's kind of where I stand. You know, I thought it would be good to have at least have the conversation. I think that the business community is smart enough to look at you know what they want to do with their own businesses and you know for us not to man mandate you know you know masking i was just i don't know if i'm out there you know you know do other folks here think that there should be a reinstitution of masking in the community I'm not, I'm not sure. I think if individual businesses would like to reinstate that, then go for it. I know some already have. Um, I know schools are still going to be masked up 24-7. Athletics are not right now, but who's to say when it comes to the winter season what's going to be going on? Um, I don't really have a say right now or uh, yes or no. Yeah, I think it's tough because, you know, Simon, I'm in one of the most high risk businesses and it's really hard because even if we mandate masks, you're sitting there eating and drinking without a mask. And the state's not telling us we're doing something incorrect. So it's really hard. I know last time we felt like the state wasn't moving fast enough on maybe bringing in the original mask mandate that they ultimately did do. I have not heard that they are considering it at least very seriously and I know that I've the only way they could do it, I think, is if they reinstated that emergency order, which I've heard there. Yeah, the governor is right. very reluctant to, yeah. to do that. I mean, you know, they're talking about looking in other places in the world, and England and the Netherlands and India. The, you know, the Delta variant has ramped up, and then it kind of plateaus. And, you know, so there's some evidence around the world that while Delta is highly transmissible, that, you know, it, it will begin declining. You know, we saw in the news tonight that the uh, Pfizer vaccine now is fully fully authorized by the FDA, so they're hoping more people will get vaccinated. I mean, I think that's that's a huge key, is the vaccination rate. Um, if nobody's really inclined to, you know, to, to do it, if there's questions, I would suggest that we don't. Um, we'll see how it goes in the next couple weeks. And I'll try to find out, and if Lisa finds out from this press conference tomorrow what this deal is about having to have the health department sanction it, if we're going to do it, I can bring that back and can revisit the issue. But I think for now, given what I'm seeing out there, that uh, you know most businesses uh, all still have signs up that say if you're not vaccinated, put a mask on. And I see the same thing that you're seeing. You know, when I go to shops now, I, I put my mask on. There are just, more, a lot more masking going on so. recently. And there's signs too, masks not, not required, but appreciated. Right. right. My chiropractor stayed open the entire time, never shut down one day, never required masks, never did anything. And there's been no cases of COVID come out of his office at all. The only reason I'm wearing this here is because the sign says I have to. I'm, I don't want, quite honestly, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Mm -hmm. I just, I we're all tired of it. And yeah. Go away a lot faster if everybody did what they should do. They say if you, if you get the virus, your immunity is 6.7 times better than if you get the actual, you get the vaccine. So. Yeah. And I, I think I've told you before, I'm pretty sure I had it last spring. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, 
that's neither here nor there. Having 6.7 yeah. times more immunity is great, but you know, having, having to be hospitalized or dying is, right. you know, And to me, the, other, the, other the way I look at, you know, I'm vaccinated, I firmly believe in vaccination, but I also, those of us who are vaccinated, we could become carriers. And that's where I'm working, you know, you know, even though we have 85% 80, vaccination rates, all of us who are vaccinated, we could still be transmitting it around to other, you know, luckily we're probably not gonna die or go into the hospital, but I, I'm proud of our, the vaccination rates in, in, in Vermont. And I, you know, I just brought it up for a subject. I think it's gonna become maybe more of an issue come of, you know, weeks down the road, depending upon what we see, what happens with this fourth wave. Sure, and as we go inside into the winter. Exactly, everything's going to be going, you know, right now, I love going outdoors, and, you know, I think your transmission rate is so low being outdoors, you know, but indoors, I'm starting to even think of a lot more places, even though I am vaccinated, just for everyone's health, you know, that wearing a mask is a good thing. My personal opinion. Yeah, I think we, Keep an eye on what's happening in the community and find out the answers to even if it's an option and then we can discuss yeah. it in the future. Okay. All right. Uh, any further comments on that before we move on? Uh, item B, discuss transfer of EFUD property to the town. And we have a guest to speak about. Let's get no, me yeah, if you, if you could, that'd be great. Um, so they all will get to see me? Yeah, and if you use the same owl, you gotta speak up. I'm not even talking loud enough, so it turns over and um, focuses on you. That's the owl. Yeah, I didn't know whether that was oh, somebody here. coming in or what. Coming in there, yeah. um, if you know about a little bit of history with the uh, village and its hundred years of uh, existence. We tried to merge with the town, I don't know, eight or nine times and it all failed and um, we gave up and uh, went and formed a utility district and got a charter and uh, three years ago and when that passed we kept all the village property and things that we had. Um, that we had acquired over different years. And uh, after three years, we're now, um, some of these properties we don't need for the utility district, the operation of the water and sewer. Um, so there's four properties, I'll pass out this. We've kind of listed the properties and their current uses and how we um, acquired them as well. Um, I started on the list from the small to the largest here. Um, and the smallest one that the uh, EFOOT owns is the welcome sign down by the underpass. Um, it's a small piece of property that the welcome sign sits on. I think we probably acquired it in 1957 when that underpass was built acquiring right away. So that's the sign on it. and. Um, does the railroad charge you anything for that? Pardon? Does the railroad charge you anything for it being in the right of way of the railroad? Um, it's outside the railroad right of way. Um, yeah, they own it in fee simple. I mean, you own that. EFUD owns that. Yeah. 50 square feet. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I only know a little bit about that was I was a trustee when. Uh, Village decorating went into the building that uh, the you know uh, FedEx is there, um, and we gave them some of that land for parking at the time. So, um, and the new sign that went up a few years ago, the town paid for um, things. So that's the welcome sign. The next up was the Elm Street parking lot. It's a little bit larger there used for parking. The uh, trustees acquired it in uh, 1959. We bought two buildings from Phil Baker. 1999. 1999, yeah. Um, and then we, uh, you know, advertised and constructed the parking lot. Um, the town, 
plows it. Um, and at the time of the construction, the town contributed $15,000 toward the construction cost, right? Um, next up was the Rusty Parker Park. Um, the village acquired it from the railroad in 1930. It was used to store wood for the steam engines and things, and uh, they negotiated with the railroad. Originally, the railroad wanted $7,500, and the village uh, got it for $4,750. They paid for it our water department money that they paid back. Uh, there is a clause in the deed that says it can only be used for public uh, buildings on it, so you couldn't sell it uh, to a private party and have them construct something on it. In 1938, there was a water shortage in the village and things, and uh, they went around and drilled about, I don't know, 15 or 18 test wells all over Waterbury, and the only place they found water was a gravel pack well in the park. That's when that pump house was built and it was used to uh, supply water to the village when there was a shortage coming off of uh, Hunger Mountain there with the normal source. I think the town pays to maintain the park at this time, whatever it does. Um, EFUD has put some repairs into the park, I mean the pump house at the park that uh, used for the constants. Uh, I think it's a little over $5,000 brickwork. Yeah. So the, just to be clear, the town, the town highway department personnel uh, mow the lawns there, and the town takes care of um, the trash there. Uh, EFUD pays all the power bills for you know, the gazebo, the pump house, and, and all that. Uh, the Rotary Club uh, does a number of things in there on an annual basis, and uh, usually in December, Al Lewis for the Rotary Club sends me a letter and says, Rotary has spent this much on these things, like light posts and repairs to the gazebo and the like, and they ask for reimbursement of some of that. That is paid for by the water department right now. So the, the town's maintenance of that property really amounts to Sometime so mowing and trash disposal. Um, the pump house, um, you know, we find has spent forty-eight hundred dollars this year so far on masonry work to report and do some brick work there. Maybe we'll help about ten percent, and then we got to do a little bit of work on the roof. So that's in the budget. And last on the list and largest is the uh, 40 acres uh, down with the ice center on River Road. That's the old uh, dump site. Um, and it has multiple uses at that time. It's the, uh, you know, material storage from construction and things, recreational activities. And uh, in 2002, the village leased for 99 years an acre of land to the ice center for that construction along with some uh, parking areas and a uh, potential outdoor ring. Um, this has a little more history of re, uh, how we acquired it that I'll talk about in a minute. It also, when it was used as a, uh, a dump, I'm probably the only person here who is living in Waterbury before the interstate was built, uh, that we had a dump that's underneath the interstate now, and when the interstate came through in 59, they paid, they took that land and paid uh, the village something for it, and the field where the ice center is was owned by the state. And after negotiation, somehow the village ended up with that land where the uh, ice center is, and when we got it, there was a hole probably 15 or 20 feet deep where the state took the gravel out to use in the interstate. Since we had closed our dump, we were looking for a dump site. So we then jumped on the chance and filled that hole in with trash from the 
the dump and things, and then it was closed in the 70s when there was a requirement to build landfills and it was burning and everything. Um, during that time, there was a Velcor chemical company operating out of Waterbury in the foundry building, and they collected chemicals around the state, and there were no prohibitions against it. They dumped it in the landfill, or the dump at the time, and then set it on fire, um, which burned the trash and destroyed some of the chemicals, but it left the... Uh, contamination and things that was there. The village trustees hired Heindel and Noyes in 1999 to investigate it. And I don't know how much we spent, probably $50,000 or more over eight years we had to monitor it. And in 2008, they said the levels had decreased significantly that uh, they closed the site so that we don't have to monitor anymore at this time. Something could come up in the future if something else is discovered. So that's part of my full disclosure statement. If, uh, you're interested there. Um, in 99, 98, 1998, the town did pave the road out there. That's a town road. And we do lease, uh, I don't know, five or ten acres to the town for the materials stored over the old. Uh, dump that's uh, filled in there. So um, that's a little bit of the history of the properties. What's not on this list is 51 South Main Street. That, uh, I was going to ask you if that was, <laughs> was going to look there. I didn't see it there. <laughs> it's on the back side. Yeah. It didn't I was right with you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, the commissioners are interested in uh, doing some, we paid for that, we paid a lot of cost to get rid of the building and things, and uh, it's not, we kept it open for parking during Main Street construction, but it's not, these are used for a municipal function at this time, and um, that's why we intended that they would continue as a municipal function. So you can see the appraised value, and you're probably gonna ask, what's the cost? And I think the commissioners would entertain a 25% discount for cash. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. That's to add some humor to that thing. Um, now I'm going to hand out this um, MOU with what uh, Bill and the commissioners have put together. Um, that if we want to proceed with this, this is along the lines, you know, we're thinking here. Um, has everybody got one there now? Um, in summary, the main points are in uh, Article 1 of this, and uh, we would entertain giving it to the town there may be a nominal fee of $10 or $100 if the attorneys and other people say that's uh, necessary to transfer it. But what we'd like to uh, get an agreement for those properties is that as long as EFUD exists and has employees and things in this building, um, that we wouldn't be charged rent for the space in the building, whatever they occupy. Uh, we would pay our normal share of the administrative cost and things, but uh, not including rent or major repairs and upgrades. Uh, we would pay those as a part of the uh, EFUD in, uh, customers and things. They're also town taxpayers, the majority of them. Um, and things. So they would be paying for those repairs through their property taxes. So. Um, I don't know, do you have anything that that's the crux of it? Um, I think if uh, the select board is interested in um, you know proceeding further along these lines, uh, EFUD would need to have a uh, a public informational meeting advertised either maybe uh, at one of our meetings or it could be a joint meeting with you folks where the public could. Uh, 
you know, we would tell what we're pro proposing to do, and the public could offer their comments and see what they wanted to do. I think um, there are two options to transfer it. One is the commissioners could vote to do it, and if a member of the public you know, wants to have a vote on it, they would petition us and it would have to go to a vote. Or we could have a, I think it's Australian ballot, is it not to sell property or is it voted? No, I think so. no. I think it's just Australian. those who attended at yeah, the meeting. I don't think it has to be Australian ballot. That's right, because we lost the gas station property by two votes right. um, <laughs> years ago um, and stuff. So. So they could ask for a vote that would be at a meeting and, you know, properly warned and things, so. Right. So, so as far as the, you know, the transfer is concerned, we, Skip and I, met and talked with Paul Giuliani, who has done real work for PFAS as well as the village before it and, and also the town. So as Skip indicated, um, the, the voters have a say in whether they want to sell the property or transfer the property uh, if they want to say. Uh, and I know when, when they talk about selling 51 South Main Street, you actually had a special village meeting and did it that way rather than sell it yourself and then you know, suffer the uh, petition process. The select board, uh, there's no requirement for the town to have a town meeting to, uh, to purchase or accept property. Uh, you can have one if you want, but uh, the select board could simply accept this. And as, as it's being offered for you know, no, uh, no cost to the town, there's, there's no appropriation necessary for public so you wouldn't you don't have to have a town meeting. I'm not saying that you shouldn't or you can't, but you don't have to. Um, I think from the commissioner's perspective, um, <coughs> these properties are pretty much used for the general use of the public in, in the greater Waterway community. So it seems reasonable that the town should own these properties uh, rather than EFA. Um, you know, the village was a full service municipality, was, uh, you know, had, had a bit of a charter, had, had the ability to have parks and recreation if they wanted it. They, they didn't choose to do that, but they could have that. EFA has no authority under its charter to do anything except uh, water and sewer and the revolving loan fund that it has, and it has the ability to keep and trust property that the village owned. Uh, and, and they could keep it if they wanted to, but from their perspective, you know, there's really no reason. Uh, there's minimal costs if this transfer happened. Um, you know, right now I can't remember exactly what the lease payment is, but you lease from the village or from EFA the use of two material storage areas. One is down at the ice center and the other one is this uh, at the wastewater treatment. Plant I think it's station. like thirty-seven hundred dollars uh, down yeah, at it's, it's I think it's about forty-eight hundred dollars or something like that altogether. Yeah. So that lease payment could go away if you own that property. Uh, and then you know the Rusty Park Park, it's a community facility. Uh, it's used by everyone for concerts and farmers markets and all kinds of events. So the town owning that uh, seems to be a uh, reasonable thing. And then the ice center property, uh, again, that it's almost exclusive. Well, you got the material storage area down there, which is exclusive to the town right now. It's all all the gravel and crushed asphalt and everything down there is used by the town. Uh, and then the rest of the property is pretty much in recreation uses. And again, the EFUD has no authority to really run any recreation. They have a couple of leases 
on the property right now, which would stay in effect if the transfer happened. The ICE Center has a lease basically for the building that the land the building sits on. And then that lower soccer field, Capital Soccer, has a lease. We that just renewed that just for, 10 for 10 years. years. So I it's think got so. nine more years on that lease. Yeah. And they're, they're interested in leasing more land out there. So. And, uh, so those leases would transfer to the town as to be? Yeah. The landowner would have those leases. So if you became the landowner, you, those leases run with the land. So do you know approximately what the ice lease? Yeah, it it's it's cheap. It's a long lease. What's that? The uh, does lease? the uh, the lease cost to the ice center on an annual basis? Oh, it's like ten dollars cheap. Or something like that. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're the ice they're center lease I think is about hundred dollars. Yeah, you're not going to be paving any roads with revenue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've had a number of meetings with folks that are interested in the skateboard park down there. So that's one of the incentives we'd like to transfer that to you folks and you could deal with that. <laughs> well, it, that brings up a good point, though. That, that 40 acres is subject to an Act 250 permit on the ICE Center was going to develop that property. Uh, to build the ice center, it had to go through Act 250. So the whole 40 acres is subject to Act 250. There is um, a master plan that is on file with Act 250 that got permitted by Act 250, right, Steve? Uh, yes. And that is, you know, there's there's always things changing down there. So you know, if uh, if uh, Certainly, if the skateboard park, which they, I'm not sure if they've approached the recreation committee or not, Frank. I know that the recreation committee has expressed some concern about whether that's a good location for it or not. But um, whatever should happen down there uh, going forward, uh, we probably sh should have a new master plan developed for the site. It's unfortunate that the select board back in the day decided to pave that road. It was, and I was all for it at the time, and it was a, it was a mistake the day we did it. Um, we did it to save the grader from going down there several times a summer, and uh, we saved that money. Uh, we spent money to put the pavement down, and I think sending the grader down there uh, maybe by now it would have cost the same amount as the paving cost. But the road's really in the wrong place if you're going to use that property down there for its best intended purpose of, of a recreation facility. The road goes right down the center of that uh, field. You know, it's going to go in right where it goes because the river's hard by there. But once it breaks out into the field, you know, it should be over near the railroad track where the water and sewer lines are. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a different issue. So well, this might be a stupid question, but EFUD being EFUD and no longer a municipality, are these properties subject to property tax? Well, EFUD is a municipality. Uh, okay, that was no so sure if they were They're not subject private. to property taxation right now because they're within the political boundaries of, of the municipality. Okay. The properties that EFUD owns that are outside the limits of EFUD, uh, the waterworks properties, uh, that they pay taxes on that. But these, because they're within the, in the districts, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's no property taxes on them. We pay a lot of property tax to stow. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's also a historic site down at the ice center where that clump of trees is on the right. And there's a cellar hole there that we paid to have investigated. And we're hoping that uh, we could get approval to cover it over if we wanted to build a soccer field over it or not. But I don't think Steve has heard from the folks whether they approved that or not. Um, and the Elm Street lot, We've had inquiries in the past from owners of the uh, Prohibition Pig. They were interested in purchasing that lot from the village. 
one point there. We didn't, you know, he, or I guess he wanted to swap 51 South Main for that lot or something the previous. I think he was talking about paying to develop 51 South Main Street as a parking lot and, and getting the Elm Street lot, but that didn't go to the commission. And that's a different order. So. Anyway, so that's it. You folks can I let us know what you'd like to, how you'd like to proceed. Or I do have a couple of questions. Um, one, I know you see where Foss is monitoring hazards, chemicals. Is that property, the 40 acres, none of that's designated as browns, brownfields or anything like that? Um, no, it's <laughs> it's smacked as. You know, the, uh, I don't remember what the name of those things, but the uh, site management action is complete. Okay. So, uh, no, it's not under, it's not a. Uh, so it's not a contaminated site at all. It's a cleaned up contaminated site. Okay, site. that's about what I thought. Okay. You know, you wouldn't want to, I don't think you'd want to build something over where the material storage is. Okay. That it's trash underneath that was burned. We've done borings down there to see how much cover there is and things. But I would, I would yeah, recommend. I think that that's an ideal spot for material storage. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're using it, I think, for its highest and best use yeah. right now. Well, that's my was my biggest concern because of potential liability for the town. The other thing, and I guess I just don't understand why it was done in. In number four, where you have, you're exempting out Rusty Parker, you know, Memorial Park. What was the thinking behind that? You know, I don't think the town would ever be looking at selling that property, but. That was Bill's idea. <laughs> yeah, I, wrote, I, was, I, wrote that, I wrote that before I knew that the railroad had put a restriction on, on the deed. That, on the deed that said, you know, only public facilities. And, you know, there was back shortly after Irene, there were a small number of people that were really pushing to, you know, sell off some of um, Anderson Field down here to yeah. build a hotel. And in case one of those people with a bright idea decided they wanted to build a hotel on Rusty Park to Park. I thought, well, before the town can complex. sell it off, they've got to turn it back to E5. But now okay. there's a, that Skip found a, a clause in the dean that restricts it to public facilities only. And I'm not quite so concerned. And I got to get a copy of the deed to uh, uh, Dan Sweet. And he's going to lower the appraised value for the park if there's a restriction on it. So you can rest assured that okay, I, the I purchase price will go down. I didn't think you wanted to purchase. I don't think we, we want to get rid of it either. It's too much of a gem for the, the community yeah. to you know just get a buck eighty five you know for it for you know some greedy purpose. Yep. Okay, that's all I have. And the uh, that I had written that was that you know. If the community really wanted that to happen, they could do it. Yeah. But there was some hoops that had to go through before you could get rid of the park. Right. But I think the then they'll put pressure on E fund anyway. So right. it's, it's a good one. And this hasn't been looked at by an attorney as of yet. This is just kind of our thoughts, putting them together, and what if we agree with things, it would need to be. You know, looked at by the attorney. That's my my legal knowledge. I, it seemed like a pretty good agreement. Well, Bill's pretty good at that stuff. <laughs> the, um, you know, I think that Rusty Park to Park and Elm Street lot and the, the welcome sign for what that is. They're kind of no brainers. You know, there's 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 no um, there's no real big liability there. There's no huge future costs to the town. The ice center site, I think, you know, um, from EFUD's perspective, 
as I said, they don't have any authority in their charter to do anything for recreation. So they're limited. They can lease the property out if they want, but they're not the town entity. The town has a recreation department. The town has a recreation committee. And there's a lot of pressure for recreation activities down at that site. And it will, it, it takes some planning and, and because it's subject to Act 250, there's some potential costs, not huge costs, but there's time and effort kind of costs. And there's really no incentive for EFA to do anything, to do any of that work. Why do they want to spend their money on, on uh, you know, trying to do master planning and things like that when it's not a, a function that they really have any authority to be involved in. And it, I think that's the one where I think it's, a, it's an asset, and I, I think it's an asset to the community. But if the town does take that over, I want to be clear that going forward, there may be some expense. I think it's a worthwhile expense, but there's probably some expense to, to planning and uh, developing recreation there down the road. Um, and, uh, you know, One of the uh, biggest uses of that site is off-site, I think, is that mountain biking. You can go down there on a Friday night and see 70, 80 cars all parked there from yeah. people using the mountain bike. All the different yeah. people yeah. up there. Uh, Danny, I see you, your hand raised. Yeah, are you able to hear me okay? Yep, yep. go ahead. Perfect. Um, I don't have the MOU, of course, so I'd love to look at it, but I just wanted to voice my support and appreciation because I think um, I think Bill said it's a no-brainer for, for a lot of this. It makes so much sense to me to, to go through with it. Um, and then I see just a huge potential, um, as you said, in recreation with those with that ice rink area. I had um, previously talked to a couple of folks about the idea of the skate park and their plans, um, but with Perry Hill and the ice rink and the field down there, um, I do see a great potential um, for, a, for a recreational area. Of course, you know, it'll take time, money, and effort, but um, but I'm, I'm fully in support, so uh, I really appreciate it, and I, I like hearing what Kip had to say about some of the history as well, so thanks, Kip. Thanks, Danny. Random, um, random question for you. Is that old graveyard a part of this property too? That one behind the ice rink by the interstate? Like behind the dump site? Um, no. Oh, okay. That's across, I think it's across the tracks, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, oh. it's between the tracks and the interstate. Yeah. Okay. No, we don't maintain the old graveyard. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the cemetery commissioner. Um, I do have a question, I guess. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of this check and balance of the EFUD kind of being able to buy back. I guess it's kind of a safety net of sorts of if we for some reason wanted to sell these properties, but the tiny elephant in the room is what if EFUD no longer exists in the future? Does that really, do we have to think about that as we go into this MOU? Not saying that we are at this point, but if, if EFUD becomes part of the town, what happens to the majority of this contract basically becomes null and void, right? Yeah, I, I think that it would probably be null and void if the e right. went away. Yeah, I mean, it would depend on how e went away. If, I can't imagine some other entity would buy e assets, but you know, it, it could it, be the successors. But if e was absorbed into the town at some point in the future, then I think that merger document, if you will, would would take care of rolling all of their assets into the town and, and we would need this and we'll do it all. Um, so I guess my questions, just to confirm, I, I agree, I think it's a good idea. Um, ongoing annual costs associated with us taking these properties, this, the monitoring hazardous chemicals comes at little cost. At this there's point. no cost right now. There, there's yeah. nothing required at this time. It would be if somebody discovered some chemical that we hadn't, you know, 
sampled for or something. They, they always. Um, I mean, it's not even being monitored anymore, is it? No, we're not doing. No, we're not required to do anything at the point. This point. Yeah. That was my biggest concern because if you get into hazardous ways, <laughs> the, the dollars start rolling up real quick. Well, and that was that was my job for 40 years. So right. when we, you know, um, re realized in '99 that that's what had gone on there, we wanted to investigate it and deal with it early rather than you know, trying to give it away to you folks and have you deal with it. So, Thank you. So it, it turned out to be, I mean, we probably spent $50,000 on it. And then the pump house is included in this, the actual structure? Yeah. yeah. And it's no longer used as a pump house. It's the bathrooms in there. The well is actually in the house, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's all filled with concrete. There's the words benzene found in there. Who's, right. who's cleaning those bathrooms or maintaining those? Are we doing that already? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, then, and like I said, uh, you know, the, there's not minimal maintenance on the building, and in 2021, we thought spending about $10,000 to fix up the building, so I don't expect there'll be any major issues with that building in the foreseeable future. So a little bit of, a little bit of you know, property insurance that sure. Uh, so if, it, if there was any kind of major yeah. repair to a roof yeah. or brick or whatever, I just wanted to know about. <laughs> and there's there's no costs right now to the 40 acre site as either. Um, that's all. Um, and, the, and the costs down there in the future would simply would more or less be. Um, the road. You know, planning and the road's already your responsibility. So um, it was some kind of grant or something that the regional planning commission for erosion control that was supposed to go yeah, on I'm down. Not there. sure what they've done with that. Did anything ever happen? Yeah, that's uh, with a stormwater study because there's more than three acres of impervious surface down there, of gravel and roofs. And I think they decided that there are so many great grass treatment areas for the runoff that uh, there really wasn't a need to do right. stormwater treatment. So they focused in different areas like the shopping center. Yeah. Um, you know, we do, EFUD does mow down there with lefties. Uh, somebody, I can't remember who, who's the guy that's mowed that. Um, Anyway, there's a nominal, you know, a couple hundred dollars a year. Oh, Marty Wells. Yeah. Uh, we kept the field mode there, down there. So brush yeah. off. The uh, capital soccer, they maintain their soccer field. They mow that, cut that. So there's, there's really no, no real expense down there. The town's already kind of taken care of. I said the, the maintenance of the Rustic Parker Park, some of the maintenance and the trash removal. The town, I think, does pay for the lighting at the end of the parking lot already. Um, so there's not a huge. And no concerns on liability of the dog park under our. No. I was just going to ask if the dog park is still the dog park. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. There's an MOU between EFOD and whatever the dog park is called. The, the dog park people pretty much take care of the dog they park. They don't do a lot down there at all. I don't even think we have any agreement with them or other, we just allowed them to do that. We have an MOU. No, we have, we have an MOU. MOU. Well, it's not a legal lease type thing. No, no, it's not a lease. It's just yeah. a memorandum of understanding saying they have some rules that yeah. they're going to do so yeah. and so on. There's no lease. But any other questions? Are we looking to try to vote on this tonight? Or I know this memorandum has got some question marks in it. Like that. Yeah, we're not asking for the MOU okay. to be approved tonight. No, no. I, I, I think it needs to be. You know, you need to see if there's anything you want to add to it. Then, 
if you want to go forward, then we would take that back to EFUD and we would plan our informational meeting, what we needed to kind of do that. Uh, and then you could decide whether you that wanted to be a joint meeting or not, or you wanted to have a separate meeting. And, uh, and I think I think the commissioners are prepared to do the legal work necessary to transfer and everything, or no? I didn't. The, tra the legal work for the transfer, you were going to do that too, right? The yeah. Two yeah. To pay for that. Would this be subject to the one and a half percent property transfer tax? I don't know. Steve, you, you know, Mark, I've got a question. Um, Skip, you mentioned that 51 South Main is not on the list. Um, what is, does the, do the EPUD commissioners have any current plans for that property, or are you still thinking you might sell it? Or uh, the Grand Hotel? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, no, I was, just, <clears throat> I was just curious if there were, what the thinking was behind uh, retaining that and if you were thinking you might sell it or if, if that conversation has even gone that far. Well, we we talked about it that we didn't think we wanted to include it as a gift to the town. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we put a lot of, the village purchased it, we put a lot of money in cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. I think we'd like to get some of that back. How you know, what we use it for, I'm not sure. We've inquired about the potential for affordable housing on the lot there, but no, we haven't, there's no formulated plan other than to mow it for hand. <laughs> and uh, it didn't really get a lot of parking use during Main Street as much as we expected, and the bank parking lot across the street has been expanded. It has twice the parking it had originally. So I don't think it's necessary as a parking lot as probably better use of there. So but. no, that's, we that's really a separate conversation is what you're saying. Yeah. Just curious. So any other questions from the board? Do we wanna to try to go do we wanna in terms of just the warmth of the board and just in support so we can move forward with this? I mean it sounds like Danny's in support. Um, I'm in support. I'm in support. Now that I found out about the the hazardous waste kind of concern, <laughs> but it sounds like it's not an issue. Okay. Chris, I don't have any problem. Okay. And so it sounds like we'd be in support of. So you're interested in moving yeah. forward yep. with it, and I'll report back to the yep. commissioners, and we can keep in touch with you as to the steps. I think this is something. If it happened before the end of the year, I think we'd be doing good. Okay. You know, and okay. stuff is that kind of a process there so before you get up since you've already voted on this I think I'm going to keep you in the hot seat for the <laughs> municipal manager compensation I know we met and it sounds like yes. you moved forward with approving uh, what we discussed um, to remind the board the only person I believe in the town that doesn't that Bill doesn't have control over is his own compensation we're kind of behind the ball, typically be around April. Um, I think we didn't move fast enough in terms of, and we really should make this retroactive, but we as a board have to decide Bill's compensation um, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we prioritize it and, and vote on it. So that's a reminder to the board that it, does, it, it won't happen without our movement. So. Um, Bill had approached the board with everyone else's, you know, plan for increases. I believe the inflation estimate was a two percent, and so Bill worked to try to get everyone at least two percent increase. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, I just want to say that I think Bill's done a great job through uh, managing COVID and all of the difficulties that come from managing COVID. Um, financially, he presented, I believe, last meeting how well we're looking. I think it would behoove us. Bill has mentioned that we do start to need to plan uh, a master transition plan at some point. He hasn't set a date, but um, I just think we need to take all of that into account. 
Um, the E flood approved an increase of three and a half percent on Bill's compensation and a five thousand dollar bonus. I know that there was a conversation around that maybe not being something different or there or how it would be handled, but that's what I'm suggesting that we do as a board. Um, but I'm happy to hear discussion. I know in the past we've talked about, you know, public versus private and compensation. I have employees and so it's it's a it's a conversation where not everyone in the community I think has seen an increase in their income. But again, we are in control of our employees, Bill is one of them. We're doing well. We are in business of being a town. I do believe that it's warranted and fair, but happy to discuss. Yes, I can. Uh, it brought that same proposal in our head three and a half percent with a one time payment of $5,000 to the uh, e FUD commissioners at our last meeting. And, uh, they supported that retroactive till April 1st, is it? I think so. They were in support of that, that we would pay our share of, uh, you know, how the salary and administrative cost breakdown is. So. Yeah, to remind everyone that Bill's compensation is shared. I can't remember what approximately the breakdown of the changes. Yeah, in, in the town's budget, there's. Uh, there's some payments to EFUD, and then in the EFUD budget, there's payments back to the town. And I think in 2021, I don't have the budget in front of me, but it's at around $98,000 that EFUD is paying to the town, not only for my compensation, but for the compensation of other town employees that do work for EFUD. We look at that every year, um, and uh, you know, it's presented at, at budget time to both boards, and it's something that um, I think is, we had a very complicated formula at one time, way back in the day, uh, and then we finally kind of agreed this was several select board ago now, but we finally got to a point where neither board was wanting to change the formula any longer. It seemed like a good formula. So since then, it's basically just been adjusted by inflation. But um, EFUD does pay a, a portion. I, I can't tell you what the percentage is, but it, it pays its fair share. So uh, everybody knows that I've always had a rub with government compensation. Um, but let me first say that Bill Shepluck is a hell of a good man. He earns every bit that he has come into him. Um, my rub is a bigger problem than this select board could solve. Ideally, what I would like to see, if it were possible, to start with is stop annual raises every 365 days people in government are obliged a raise when the rest of a large part of the private population aren't obliged those raises so there's a disparity and outpacing of income levels that continues year after year after year and quite honestly, I think it has an impact on inflation. I believe that compensation, government-wide, that means education system as well, and you could even include hospitals into that group as well, because as time goes on, it seems more and more that hospitals are I guess under the government thumb, that uh, that contribution every year contributes to some degree of inflation. And if it were at least spread out on an every other year basis, based on the two years back, not on the prior year, that it would at least maybe level 
the scale a little bit and maybe slow down inflation. I'm even upset with what's happened across the board since COVID with just everyday living expenses, uh, building expenses, everything. I mean, it's, it was a recipe for, I guess you, to some degree you could call it uh, abuse by the markets to hike costs at such levels that has impacted uh, the economics in the country. But that can only last so long because it will self-correct itself because when people stop purchasing uh, those goods, then the companies that are providing them are forced to either lower the price or go out of business. But that doesn't happen to government. Government always stays consistent increase yearly after year well, after I, year. I disagree with your premise, Chris. Uh, you know, we, no municipal employee, uh, you know, we went from, from April of 2019 till this year and nobody got a raise until this year. So, so, and, and, you know, if you want to talk about inflation, maybe government is part of the inflationary problem. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of issues uh, that, that contribute to inflation. We've had very low inflation here. Uh, we haven't been giving anything except cost of living raises to most municipal employees for, for quite some time now. And you can argue that, that the private sector world that you live in doesn't get it. But the private sector world that a lot of people live in do get raises on a regular basis. And when you're talking about uh, executive positions in, in private corporate America, there's plenty of raises being given out. Uh, so it's, it's not quite that nobody's getting uh, raises out there in the private sector. Um, secondly, I would say that uh, we are in a world that competes with other jobs out there. And we've got people in the municipality that do things more than, you know, uh, shovel or rake or even drive a snowplow. We've got people that run water treatment plants, multi-million dollar wastewater treatment plants that they're hard positions to find somebody to run those jobs. And if you don't give people like that raises, they're going to go somewhere else. So it's not public employees just get a raise all the time and nobody else does. So I disagree with what you're saying. You're well, I won't your, get into the... In you're entitled to your opinion, but I don't think it's correct. I won't get into the internal issues that you claim nobody got any raises last year. I'm not even going to go there, okay? Well, I'd like it. If somebody got a raise that, you know, you didn't say anything. Because it, it'll end up getting nasty if I go there, okay? Okay. Um, and I didn't, I, my suggestion wasn't that private sector people don't ever get raises. There are companies out there that are making so much money that their people get raises and compensation on an annual basis. But there's a large part of the private sector that don't. And I know that for a fact because I've been in the private sector for 40 years. Okay. Uh, and those are the people that I'm trying to stick up for. Because they're the ones that are feeling the impact of all the government spending. But, back to your point, to your compensation, I have no issues with it whatsoever. It's well deserved, and you've always done a good job. And I think that if you look at what our budgets and our budget increases and our tax increases have been here over the years, uh, I think we keep them under pretty good control. I just want to say, and 
I'll preface it. I am a fiscal conservative. I have no, no problems with that. We have a person before us, Bill Shepler, who's done an outstanding job. And I think he deserves every bit of what Skip's has. I know me and Mark, we, we, we've met. I don't think Bill's a take, take, take person. I really value him as our town manager. I think we have a great town manager and we should be lucky. And I think that's the question before us right now, you know, his compensation. And I have no problem. As a matter of fact, I might even go further. But, you know, in terms of being fiscally, you know, conservative, I think Bill probably thinks that's, that's, that's adequate compensation from what the conversation myself and Mark had, had with him. I have no problem at all with compensating him in, in, in that way. I think it's really, you know, I think you have to treat employees as employees, whether they be public employees, whether they be private sector employees. There are good public sector employees, there are good private sector employees. Those people need to be compensated fairly. There are bad ones. Those people should be either fired or you know, you know, look at, you know, retraining and look at, you know, them getting on a better task. But I think... And how many times does that happen in government? I know it did when I was yeah. in government. I'm just, I'm just saying, I think too many people, there is abuse in government sometimes. But I don't think it's happening in our town of Waterbury. And I that's never what's, said that. That's, uh, I, but that's what's before us. And I think I value our town employees. I value our town manager. I think, you know, I, I think what we compensate Bill is, you know, is, I think, the least what we could compensate them is what EFUD has recommended. And that's my personal opinion. I didn't know anything about the, until EFUD met, I, I knew that this was on the agenda. I had, I had mentioned both to Mark and Skip that you know, I, haven't, I haven't had a raise. Um, at the EFUD meeting when Skip made that proposal that he just told you was, uh, passed by EFUD, three and a half percent and five thousand dollar bonus. That's very generous. That was a surprise to me. Um, I was not anticipating that. Uh, I wasn't, I, I had not, uh, you know, told anybody this is what I want. I, you know, whatever the boards decide, I, I think is, uh, I would have accepted that. And uh, I think it's a very generous offer. I am going to tell you what I told the E5 board, though. They, they surprised me with that. Um, and I would be lying to you if I told you that I didn't want to take it. But before you go and say, well, that's the least you should get, give them more, I asked the E5 board that if they would make whole the salaried employees who last year took a 5% pay cut voluntarily. And uh, there was one EFUD employee and there's, there's two other employees on the town besides me that took uh, a voluntary pay cut. And I would like to, um, I, I don't have the, the number, I don't, they took a pay cut from April to, to August. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not gonna be tens of thousands of dollars or anything mm -hmm. like that. But I would like to be able to uh, compensate those people who voluntarily took a, a pay cut. We, we laid off a number of people last year, 14 or 15 people, and it turned out they ended up getting paid more because of the $600 a week that uh, uh, you know, the federal government kicked in on top of, of the unemployment benefit they were getting. And, you know, they needed to be laid off because we had to be careful about our budget and what the federal government did made it easier to be able to tell people that they were laid off. But we laid them off because it was the necessary thing to do. But there were a couple of individuals who took a pay cut and I would like to be able to, uh, 
to compensate them for that lost wage. And they didn't get a pay raise a year ago. They took a pay cut on top of that. So even though they got their 2% inflationary um, increase this year, uh, they missed a year. So they're still kind of, in my mind, behind. I know Chris doesn't agree with that, but that's... that's but is it that your discretion built to do that? Because you, you manage the staff. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I manage the staff and I have a budget that has right. been approved by the select board right. and ultimately the voters. And uh, I think the budget will be able to handle what I just talked about. But I, I also want to be transparent. I don't want to, you know, I don't do things behind the board's back. I don't, uh, you know, if I'm going to give somebody a raise, I, I, let, I let the board know that it's in the budget. Uh, so I would, I would like to offer that as well. I don't have, do you don't have a rough idea what? I, I don't have a, I don't have a number. I'm very supportive of that too. And I don't know if uh, it was clear when Bill was talking, EFUD approved uh, making that employee's whole as Bill has recommended. So. Right. I'm also in support. I think Bill does a lot. He attends a lot of meetings and does a lot of work for the town on top of this and goes above and beyond. So I am also in support. Danny, I don't know if you. Yeah, no. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, this is certainly a unique uh, situation to be in, sitting around discussing. Uh, so, Bill, I appreciate your patience and. You know, we certainly got behind on this, so thank you for your understanding and for your patience. But um, I'm, I'm absolutely in support of the numbers that we're, we're looking at. And, um, you know, I think we'll certainly do better next year in terms of timeliness to make sure this gets done uh, at the appropriate time. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, to Mike's point, I 100% agree. Um, we're here talking about bills compensation um, you know I think the one thing that you know I mentioned before is that I don't know how much longer Bill's going to be here but we have to recognize what Bill's done since he started here we are financially I think stronger than many towns around us the investments that we've made over the years and how we've managed our money protect this town and Bill's a big part of that I think the tax stabilization fund is a great example of that um, every year that I've been on the board, I really do feel like he takes the finances at heart to continue to make this town as affordable as we can as a town. Um, you can see that through where our tax rates have landed for many years. I just, I truly believe that he cares and we are lucky to still have him around. I think once he decides <coughs> to move on, it's going to cost us a lot more money than we're paying him right now, even with this increase. And I, I'm in fully support of it. So um, it sounds like we probably have enough support to make a motion. I make before, a, you, before you do, can I just turn. remind you that I did say that my rub was not with I, him. I heard you. Yeah, and yeah not, we heard you. We heard okay. You. Yeah. And I'm not angry about what you said. I disagree with what some of what you said, but I'm not. I, so anyway, I heard what you said before. And I, and I, and I understand, you know, like I'm in, I'm in a business that has at times 150 employees. There are times where the market I feel, you know, bears who's at the door and do I feel it. But lately I've been giving raises out like crazy just to hope for retainment, you know. So I think we as a town have to understand that we are in competition with other towns, whether it's a zoning administrator or whatever else that you know, we have, we especially have some higher management that I think is going to turn over in the next couple of years, but also just a realization that if we don't keep up potentially with our competition, we can potentially have turnover, and turnover is extremely costly. So I do believe that we have to take employee compensation very seriously and not believe that, and, and I, I understand that there's an additional cost every year as a percentage of what we're paying. But there are other ways to offset it. We've seen that through. 
grantless growth and other things that have helped, but we've also seen other incomes that we didn't expect at times. Pilot's been higher than we thought it would be at times. There are other offsetting factors, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we have, we have a responsibility, I think, as a town to make sure that our employees are also keeping up with things like inflation. Bill comes every year and presents basically inflation and, and points us towards that as a, as a gauge. Um, I know that not everyone's seen increases, but I do think that this is fair and with how Bill represents our, the employees of the town's compensation on a yearly basis is very well thought out. So I appreciate that. And I do believe that this is, this is fair and warranted. So can I have a, just another second? Sure. So because of my concern for people making, you know, having a difficult time in life financially, there's some things that I've done in my own life to try to help compensate people, you know, or, or benefit people. I, I took a project on over in Duxbury to try to uh, provide affordable lots to young people so that they could get their first start, even though it was a financial burden to me to do that. I, f I felt so strongly that, you know, people that are having a hard time financially, if, if there's no help for them, where the hell are they going to be left? You know, my business, I've seen construction industry businesses across the board all raise their pricing on everything. I've held mine steady. Why? Because I know what it, the, the, the end result will be if I, along with everybody else, keep increasing my cost. It's, it's a, a, you know, a fast climb to the ladder just to fall to the bottom. I've seen it too many times. And I don't know. I just, I, it upsets me to see young people especially struggle like hell when they're trying so hard. In fact, I had a guy come down by one bale of hay off me the other night, and he's thinking about leaving Vermont. He just bought a place up on Neal and Flats here a couple of years ago, and it's become so financially difficult for him, him and his wife, that they're thinking about leaving. It's those types of people that my heart goes out to, you know, and uh, they struggle. He told me, we're struggling to try to make it here. And, uh, I don't know, it's just, it brings out the worst in me sometimes, you know, because it seems like there's no voice for those people. It just seems like it just always more and more and more. I mean, I have to respectfully disagree. I think there's plenty of people that are screaming about affordability in Vermont and school taxes and where they've been headed and the percentage increases. There's there's a significant number of people that recognize the affordability problem all the way even down in Montpelier. So to say that no one's talking about this and it's not in the public purview is not true. Yeah, there are why is plenty it? of people trying to address, you know, that we have an aging population, we don't have a young population, a lot of people are nomadic, not sticking around. Absolutely, we have, a, we have an affordability crisis in the state. We're specifically talking about I understand that. Just gets me away. And I, and I don't think it's fair to Bill to, to go off and not focus yeah. and, and make him feel in any way that this isn't. No. Or if he does, I apologize. No, no, for I, that. no problem I want to, I'll, to move the question. Yeah. I, I make a motion to uh, approve a 3% raise for the town manager accompanied by a one-time $5,000 um, it was 3.5. 3.5. Oh, 3. Three. Okay. Yeah. 3.5. Sorry, I didn't want to cheat you, Bill. 3.5% um, increase to his annual compensation with a one-time uh, bonus of $5,000. Can you add retroactive to? Retroactive to April 1st, 2021. I'll second it. All right. Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Well deserved. Moving on, errors and omissions, the addition, item D. 
Thanks, right. Skip. So I emailed this to you Thank earlier. You, uh, Dan Thank Sweet you. sent you a letter. There's a property owned by a Mr. and Mrs. Crow. They purchased a lot and home on Cary Lane in November of 2020. The assessor reviewed the listing at the request of the landowner on August 12, 2021. And a number of errors in the data contained in the listing were discovered. This errors and omissions entry is submitted to correct the listing in the grand list and to pr produce a corrected tax bill. The assessed value was four sixty six seven hundred, and the tax amount was ten thousand eight hundred thirty seven dollars. The corrected value is four hundred thirteen thousand two hundred, and the tax will be nine thousand five hundred ninety five dollars. The second property is Waterbury Commons. They had previously been assessed on seven approved <coughs> lots. Three of the approved lots have been sold in twenty twenty, resulting and a net of four remaining approved lots. <coughs> the assessor had failed to remove the lot sold from the Waterbury Commons listing. So the original assessed value was 175, 175,000, and the tax amount was 3,989. The corrected value was 100,000, and the tax amount would be 2,279. So in both cases, the assessed value was lowered, meaning the taxes were lowered. Remind us, um, so we need to agree to these changes, basically. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a pro forma. This is how it's written in the statute that um, if if there's something that comes to the attention of the listers, or in our case, the town assessor, um, that we can make these corrections that that were obvious errors on the part of on the part of the town, and since. The select board has to set the tax rate on the approved grain list. You, you've got to make this change. We, we don't change the grain list and raise everybody's taxes. This is just, you know, there'll be a few thousand dollars worth of taxes that we won't collect this year. But it, this happens usually usually once a year. Yeah. So. And on the water rate commons, is that saying that four lots are valued at 175 now? Hundred thousand each, or is that the no? So there were seven lots at one seventy-five. That was listed as basically land owned Village by Waterbury Commons. So three lots have been sold. Twenty-five thousand dollars per lot comes off of this assessment. So the four lot, it's twenty-five thousand dollars a lot. That's what it's in for taxes. All right, any questions? All right, uh, so we need a motion for, or we need to sign it. So motion and then we sign it as a board? Yeah. Okay, anyone want to make the motion? Motion to approve the errors and omissions. Uh, That's dated August 23rd. Document as Presented August 23rd, 2021. Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Can you sign it? All right. Uh, item E added Mike's concerns over. Is it specific to the reservoir? Yeah, this is specific. Um, I didn't know it was going to, it, it's, it's become, maybe becoming an, an issue. Like I wound up getting, I'm, a, I'm on the, in full disclosure, I'm on the board of the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir, uh, their board. And I guess there was just something that came out in that group. This was a Vermont State Police uh, press release that came up, I guess, uh, the Middlesex Barracks, uh, there was lewd and lascivious conduct down at the reservoir and again I'm looking at this release it doesn't kind of say very specific as to what happened. Does it say where? The reservoir is a pretty big uh, place. It, it, do, it, it doesn't say it's not very specific and this is all just come to my knowledge. Then I was fishing on the reservoir this afternoon and when coming off the reservoir, there was a gentleman at the Blush Hill Access that he said he was he was attacked by two gentlemen. 
and I don't know how accurate or whatnot, but I'm wondering, you know, it's funny that the two things have kind of come back to back. And I know there have been a lot of issues at the reservoir, you know, because of the conflicts. It was, I was really amazed today at how low, I guess because with back to school, um, you know, and I guess the weather wasn't as good as it was, but today was as light a traffic as I've seen. And maybe things are going to start leveling out, but things have been pretty tense at all the accesses. So I don't know. I don't know if there's anything that can ha that can happen. This is more just to bring this to, to you, all your attention. Well, when he told you that he was attacked by two people, did, did he report it to the police? Well, I, I asked that. That's... I said, did you, did you report it to the police? You know, and basically he said, no, it's not going to do anything. You know, he was very reluctant to do it. You know, I was concerned for his safety more than anything else, and. Um, you know, I said, did you get the person's license plate? You know, I said, you really might want to report this to the state police because if you were attacked, this may happen to other people. And if you know something, it, it may help someone else. And, and, and I don't know, he was not very forthcoming in terms of details. He basically kind of wanted to not broach the issue much more. So whether how true it is, but after the, you know, just getting this report of, the, I don't know what it, what it entails, because the state mm -hmm. police report is very kind of vague about what the lewd and lascivious conduct was. Comment from Lisa. Lisa. Um, it happened across the reservoir from the Blush Hill access near the remote campsites. I think to Bill's point, and it's something I'm a little surprised by, I have a lot of conversations that I don't think there's a full awareness of even um, residents in the town that we have a police force. Right. I think because we contract with the state police and they're straight police vehicles, there's not an understanding that there is somebody in town a lot of times during the week that we can call and the response time will be much better than I think what previously the town area of Water, just calling the general just balance. called and they never showed up or whatever else so i think that you know it's an interesting challenge to make sure that the residents know that they can call and probably get a police officer pretty quickly right and not feel like they need to self-police by any means or whatever else so. and i don't know how we could get that word out because i think that is an important fact that you know there is policing available to us how old is this gentleman? Let me ask you. The one that I met this afternoon? Yeah. Middle age, older? Mm, he's probably, I would guess, in his 50s. A little heavy set. Uh, yeah, it's really, I mean, I don't know. If there's people, any people should know that, you know, if, if there's, if they get, Hassled by somebody, yeah. you're going to call it attack. Your 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 action is to call the police. Exactly. That's why I encourage. But you know, it, it was kind of right before, and I dealt with it the best I could, trying to encourage him to make some sort of report. But but he, he was saying, well, nothing's going to ha happen of it. You know? Well, we had talked several meetings ago about trying to get Lieutenant White here. Oh, now that summer vacations are right. ending and everything else. I'll try to get Lieutenant White here, uh, maybe one of your September meetings, just to talk about things in general. Yeah. Um, before the pandemic, uh, the troopers were having either monthly or every two weeks meetings uh, up above the fire station for community input and uh, would that be something you could discuss? With we can you? talk to Lieutenant White about that again. I know that they were a little disappointed with the attendance of those. There were very few people that, that came. I, I know, but it wasn't very well publicized either. They used to also come to our select board meetings, and that, with all the pandemic, kind of that, that lessened too. Yeah. So. 
It's more of an FYI. You know, I hope this is not something that's going to become more of a, more of an issue that's going to, you know, without having a police. We do have a police force, but with only having, you know, two troopers, you know, maybe they just need to be aware. Sure. It's two more than the town used to have. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, okay to move on. Uh, manager's items, consider Borek grant application letter of interest. Is this specific to Hope Davy? Yeah, this one is. So Frank Spaulding uh, from the chair of the recreation committee and Steve Watts, who's the planner, are gonna read this off. Uh, Meg Belvoir and Jane Brown are also on the rec committee and they're in the back of the room. Thanks for recognizing me, Bill. Thanks, Jane and Meg. Um, so the, maybe give one did the board get a chance to read this before? Uh, I did send it I out. I sent it late this afternoon, whether they got a chance yeah, to read it. Yeah, not in the five. So there, there's a grant application that's due the 27th or something like that? Uh, there's a letter of intent that is due. Uh, so the VOA grant application is a, uh, um, it's essentially a 100% grant. There is no match required. Um, available for uh, um, immediate recreation improvements around the state of Vermont. That's part of the recovery from COVID and part of Governor Scott's initiative to, to, to promote so recreation. The state is the granting agency? state is the granting agency through uh, Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative, which is a uh, nonprofit support group uh, promoting uh, recreation, recreation economy in the state of Vermont. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read the, uh, the document, this is essentially just a, a letter of intent. Um, by Friday, we need to, it's an online form, we need to submit our intent along with a project description and a budget uh, for a scope of work which must include actual physical work to the property. Um, the Recreation Committee since December has been discussing Hope Davy uh, Park. Uh, specifically the uh, uh, southeastern portion of the, we we'll call it the back portion of the park where there's a disc golf course and uh, which essentially overlays and um, is on top of a former uh, nature trail. Um, we've been um, working since that, since last December to, to come up with uh, a solution to the use conflict um, that, that is occurring out there. And, and really we've recognized, early on we recognized the need for a long range management a long range management or master planning process. And as early as January and February, we were brainstorming ways to get it done, including possibly reaching out to the Rubenstein School of UVM, master's or, master's or senior program to take on as a project. That was unsuccessful. Um, but anyway, so it's a been identified need. Uh, this grant comes along and provides an op a perfect opportunity. And what you see before you is essentially uh, um, essentially mirrors what the committee has been identifying as a need for this property. It is a long-range master plan um, uh, through contracted services um, following the uh, uh, format that has been laid out through the Department of Forests and Parks for uh, using, uh, for planning recreation in town forests or town properties. Um, so it would uh, bring back a master plan, uh, scope of what to do and how to, uh, the physical and possible operational changes to address the conflict of use that occur, currently occurs in the back of the park. Um, we intend, we would intend for it to be a robust public process, uh, meaning that all parties would have access and place at the table, and that the product of this uh, planning process would be a path forward. And uh, the committee has identified early, um, the Recreation Committee identified early that we know that we will need trail work out in the back of the park. It's, it's given. Where exactly the alignment of that trail work and how and where it goes, we don't know yet because that's what the master planning process is for. But we identified that we will need substantial trail work. This grant asked for money to do that. The committee also recognizes that in the front of the park, the developed portion of the park, there is a need to improve the accessibility of those amenities that currently exist in the park. There is no ADA access to the shelter. There is no ADA access to the toilets. There is no ADA access to the playgrounds. This grant application would solve that. After the planning process, again, we know that there would be a certain length of trails, roughly. We don't know what the alignment would be or what, how the actual layout would be. The master planning process would provide that. So this lays it out. The budget we're asking for is $299,000, $299,500. Um, these estimates are based on um, 
I actually contacted the SE group, which was the group that um, assembled the toolkit for the Department of Forest and Parks and Recreation for this process, and they gave me a budget of $60,000 to execute this, roughly speaking. Understood, no, no not, can't hold them to it, but they, they gave me a price. Uh, the trail construction estimates are based on um, an estimate that we have for the South End of Willoughby that the state has for the South End of Willoughby to do a similar type trail um, based on the length that we measured out. Improvements to the front of the park are based on uh, similar work that's being currently executed by a well-known trail builder up at Mount Philo State Park, um, and estimates are based on those figures. Um, administrative costs and website enhancement um, is our, really our effort to make sure that once this work is done, um, that we tell everybody about it so that it has the effect we want it to have. So we're asking for the approval to move forward this letter of intent. Um, we will submit the letter of intent. The uh, granting agency will go through all the letters of intent and then come back and invite you to apply a full uh, submit a full application. I want to thank Steve for an amazing amount of work he did today to get this really wrapped up for us because this came together quickly and, and it wouldn't come together without your work. Meg and, and James work as well. So. Any questions? Is the maximum grant amount three hundred? Is that how you amend them? That's totally random. But what you want? What, why was the three hundred thousand dollars a number? Was it? Uh, that's just how your estimate came out. Um, <laughs> hooray! There's five million dollars total. They're hoping to issue about twenty-five grants. Uh, it's likely to be pretty competitive. Anytime you offer people money, uh, municipalities money without um, match, it's um, very attractive. Um, the group that is um, promoting the idea of a skate park down by, by a skateboard park down by the ice center is also interested in applying as a nonprofit. Uh, it doesn't have to be a municipality that applies; it can be a nonprofit organization. But the whole letter of intent process is to. Um, get feedback from the Department of Forest and Recreation on the proposal, so they'll give us feedback, and then as uh, Frank said, they'll invite a certain number to do full applications. And then we can get into more detail it's at that time that we would actually get your authorization for a, a more precise budget. In other words, we come back to you, because we won't know until the end of September if we're selected for um, to be an applicant, and then those are due by the middle of November. So, it's a multi-step process, and this is just the first part of the process. So this really isn't so much of, of a, a letter of intent as it is a preliminary application. That, that's a good way to phrase it. So, because with a letter of intent, you're just letting them know that you're going to apply. Yeah. In this process, they're going to review all the letters of intent with, with all these summaries and budget estimates, yeah. and then they're going to actually cut some out and invite the others to apply. So yeah. it, so it's just a little bit of semantics. But yeah. it is a it's this is actually going to be judged and will be this is already a competitive process right now. And, right. and I feel really good about this because you know Jane attended there's an online educational forum about this grant and there's five pillars of recreation that they want you to meet. This project nails them all. You know, really, we we've really taken the time to to align this project with with those pillars that are identified in the grant application. So I'm naturally optimistic. So when it, comes, else, so when it comes to the grant amount, and I, I just did the quick math, it's at five million twenty-five two hundred thousand on average. Is there is there partial funding to any of these grants, or if they decide that you? gone too big or you do you just lose the opportunity what how does that work in terms of like is there a chance to get a hundred instead of 300 do they partially fund things to try to spread the money out how does that so first of all I, I need to disclose that I'm actually an employee of the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation okay. but I have nothing to do with this grant <laughs> process um, I realize I should have said that out from the beginning in fact because of COVID I've not even met the people that we hired to do this so uh, to be fair met, uh, did they talk about that at all Jane no they did not um, that question did not come up. Yeah, come on up. Hi, I'm Jane Brown. I'll get the chair I'm on that committee. I'll just stand up. So that question didn't come up um, in the information session that I attended. Uh, so I don't. I had the impression that they are trying to fully fund projects. Um, I also had the impression that 
it is like a pre-application process and that there's some give and take in the next month where you can, um, they're available to discuss. It actually says it like they want to help you strengthen your application. So it, I was just reviewing what it said and, and that it includes, um, I think in our description we don't really get to say much about stakeholders, but I think your application is strengthened by having more particip participating groups. And, and without getting into too much, much detail about the golfers, if we could identify who some of these parties are. Um, the, it's getting a little off top topic with your question, but I think what they want you to do is, is really hit the nail on the head and have a strong application and, and get fully funded. And um, the toolkit for the forest, parks, and recreation, Meg and I both met online with um, K4, who, who developed the toolkit for uh, as an employee of forest, parks, and recreation. And it's a very, um, I think it's perfect for this process because it, it was developed for town forests, but the, the goal is to, use, to include stakeholders, to get people around the table, to work out what their visions are. And we have been trying to address like problems, putting out fires, sort of whack-a-mole with the whole disc golf and the, and the, the controversy and, and um, maybe, I guess it's just different, different uses up there in the park. And this is where it became obvious we need, we need a plan. And this is what Kate told us when we met with her about this toolkit. Um, the purpose is to develop your, your vision and your goals as a group and get all the stakeholders at the table rather than going after all the problems one by one, which is what we've been trying to do. So we're kind of going backwards, going, it's, it's, we, have, we need a vision, we need to have some, um, some buy-in and everybody won't get everything they want, but uh, we need this process and this is, this is perfect for where we're at with this Hope Davy having attended um, since November myself for committee meetings and <clears throat> met with the disc golf group, et cetera. So um, I think it's a, it's, and maybe we can, uh, we're still. I just want to say, anyway. yeah, I just want to say that I think this is not just about disc golf. Uh, this is really, really addressing the entire property because it is the entire property that feeds into that. When we talked about the trail system you know, the, the economic development, you think about the, the, the soccer jamboree that goes on there, and if you think about people waiting to play a game, suddenly that trail becomes something that those people can do. And, and, and a quick visit to the park becomes a day at the park, and a day at the park becomes a stop in the library and having dinner. That's, that's the kind of thing that this grant is all about. It's about uh, uh, charging up the outdoor recreation economy to help communities. And we've got a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of bonuses with Waterbury designated downtown all the good things we're doing, all that stuff that's great about this process. And I think one of the nice things about our application is if they do come back and say it's too much, we have a front. Will they do that, potentially? I don't know. I, I, I think, I think it's, it, it, the, grant, the grant process I've been involved in, I've been in-house, so it's not fair for me to know that. But the, uh, the, uh, if they came back and said it's too expensive, we have a front and a back we're doing. We can pick a winner, and we can say, okay, let's not let's not do the ADA path. We'll, do, we'll, we'll deal with that later on. Or we can pick the most important thing to get done, and say, well, let's just focus on the back forty here, and um, and 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 then we'll, we can rewrite the grant application to reflect that. So we have we. It's not like if they came back and said it's too expensive, we didn't have a fallback. So I think that's a good place to be with this application. They want a minimum of a fifty thousand yeah, dollar application. Too and they require implementation. You can't just apply for planning money. So it's a little, okay. so, but we could, we, there's some obvious things that we know need to be, you know, we'd like. Okay. So yes. we were careful, we were careful not to be too uh, uh, scripted about what we were going to do, because we didn't want to shortcut the planning process. It's ingenuous to people that take part in the planning process. If we come out and say that we're going to blow a multi-use trail through the back part of the park, we don't know what we're going to do with that trail system in the back part of the park, but we know we're going to need some trail system work in the back part of the park. The, the application's working, so. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just say that we have a really tremendous opportunity with this grant to change the narrative about Hope Davy. 
which I think is really the exciting thing. This is, could be so great to actually have a new vision and set a new plan and then be able to move forward with this incredible natural resource and also, you know, just the whole span of recreational activities in our town. So like, okay, Jane was saying the whack-a-mole. Like, just stop all this, like, okay, the disc ball through, the whatever. It's not really about that anymore. It's about how Waterbury as a town wants to support disc golf as a recreational offering, okay? How that looks, we don't know. And we have a natural resource that we also have to protect, because if we don't, you know, it's really taken just a huge wear and tear out there. The other thing being is that it's actually been identified as a class two jurisdictional wetlands, which I didn't even know what that meant, but that means that it's, it's a class two wetlands, which is a protected class in Vermont. And a jurisdictional wetlands mean it's not mapped, but in fact, it's a protected wetlands. So in terms of looking at this grant time and thinking about how we can revision as a you know, whole community and as a town, look at what we've got, look at what we want to do and be able to go forward and stop, you know, stop what we've, you know, been dealing with. It's been a really long hard process as we all know. So <laughs> the whack-a-mole and all right. So that's really the thing. We have to think about the environment. So in talking with Kate Forer and also um, actually several recreational specialists for the state, what I learned was that it's really important to start with your foundation, and the foundation is the Hope Davy Park itself. So of course we've got the 18 acres natural area in the back, and we also have the playing field area in the front, which my understanding is about 10 acres. So how we would want to start for this grant process is actually map, if you will, map the vision, map the land, map the resources, and really look at what we've got. So where are the sensitivities? Okay, where are the sensitivities in the land itself? I mean, we have those out there. We have it in the front with the wetlands. We have the Thatcher Brook in the back, which is also a wetlands. We have vernal pools, which are protected, you know, in and of themselves. And once they're identified, that's, you know, also class two wetlands. So you get into buffers, you get into all this other stuff, right? So we have to know all that. And then once we know that, we can say, you know what? We've got this. And OK, over here on recreation for the back area, we have disc golf, which has been tremendous. I mean, people love it. And true, you know, clearly in Waterbury, we support that. And we want that to continue. How that can continue within that space you know, it's not 20 years ago, it's the year 2021. And, you know, things are different. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of use. And there's also, um, in the community, if you think about it, with a new uh, company that's moving in, there's gonna be more residents. We had the community event down there a couple weeks ago, and a whole bunch of families, about 100 um, folks were out there, and the playground was full, and all these people, went out like into the natural area all the way down to the river and they didn't even know that that was down there. They didn't realize that that is part of the park. And I think that that's really important. So I'm you know, so glad that in this grant we can also have, like Frank said, you know, we want to make sure, we talked about this in our committee, it's so important to revision you know, and do all this work, and then at the end, at this point, like we want to share that. So even in our own community, you know, folks don't know. No, and they, they just simply if you go to the picnic know. shelter at Hope Davy, there is a map mm -hmm. um, in a circular plaque that shows the walk, walking trail in the multi-use area. And it's what the original walking trail was, and it was sort of circular to the Chat Thatcher Brook, came back across the knoll, the little spur and then it comes back out across the little bridge that was built by Ben and Jerry's volunteers 20 years ago. So the disc golf course came along and evolved and on kind of on top of those trails. And so now for somebody to walk and follow those trails, they are crisscrossing disc golfers. And so we, what has evolved on its own is to, at cross purposes to each other. So it's, this is why we think we need a management plan. Let's Find out what the resources are, 
do the mapping, get people together to talk. What is, what's intentional? What do we want? And we have a lot of young families that, that would like to use that natural area too. So uh, I think that's why the toolkit is perfect for this, and it's a great opportunity. So Let's jump to the other select board members. Have any questions? Just in essence of time. I should. Um, I'll ask the hard question. As much as I think all the stuff in the front is, is all great, I, I think the whole thing is great. What I know we have discussed is the conflicts that have happened. Yeah. Will this planning process bring some, you know, finality and some good common sense, you know, cooperation between the different parties? I'll go back to what Jane said. Uh, the, 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 I think, and, and I'll describe it this way actually, is I, I have this belief that, that when, you're, when you have a mission, you have a big arrow that drives your mission, and then within that big arrow, you got little arrows going everywhere. You hope they all go the same direction. Right. We were working in the land of little arrows. We didn't have a big arrow. And this is the big arrow. So I think the, the answer to the question is, this is the, this is the best way to, to resolve, uh, because the whole goal is to bring all the parties, not just disc golf, not just the neighbors, but, but, but businesses, other other users, uh, uh, you know, WADA, you know, uh, you know, all these people come to the table and we as a community come up with a resolution to this and move forward. So the answer to your question quicker than I should have than I took is yes, this is the way to help fix that. Good, I'm glad because yeah. it's what we need to have. Yep. Um, I'm in support of this. I just had a couple questions. I don't know if you can answer now, but um, you say on the back page, informational and interpretive kiosks. Is that kind of going to be similar to the one that's in front of the trails right now, or the historical so ones? So none of them. None, so none of this is intended to be totally prescriptive. Right. So a kiosk is a placeholder for physical information on the yeah. site, be it kiosk, be it panels, whatever it may be. Um, we put a, a monetary placeholder in for that interpretation because that would also come out of the planning process as well. Do you think you would have that on the back trails, though, or just out in the front? I, 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 I don't think, I think this is agnostic to that. I think, okay. I mean, actually, you're right, it is in the front, but I, I, don't, I think that interpretation could be, a, could be an element that comes out of the master plan. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't exclude it, and nor nor would I commit to include it at this point in time. I think that's really got to come out of the master plan. And I'm dodging a question I know, but, but I think <laughs> I'm really trying. To, I'm really trying to honor the planning process mm -hmm. and make sure that that if there may be people that want to say it's like it's a nature trail. I don't want any signs on it, and and or or I want everything fully interpreted to the full extent that you can put a post somewhere. So we got to find that balance, and I want the planning process to do that without not declaring it. Okay, and then a follow-up, maybe you won't answer this one too. Um, parking improvements, if you had any ideas, because parking's been an issue there for so long, and even on the main street that's just been paved, like, there's no parking signs on private lawns, so <laughs> if you had any ideas or yeah. ways to address it with stakeholders. Sure. So have you been up to the park lately by the picnic shelter and seen the expansion? I mean, it's yes. right near... My house, yeah. <laughs> so I think the answer is that we're working on it. Mm -hmm. And that's a separate project that our department's been helping with. I think um, once that gets finished, then I think we're going to have to reassess this through this master plan process and see, uh, you know, not only uh, how we manage events, but um, manage the visitation so that people aren't parking on neighbors' lawns and so on. So I think the answer is yes, that will be part of the. But we didn't identify physical work because we're not at that point. Right. So he answered. First. <laughs> so uh, grants. Grants always make the hair rise on the back of my neck because one problem with grants is there's never any reoccurring revenue source to support the problem that's created by the grant or the effort created by the grant and I'm wondering if what kind of support system, financial support system would be needed after say you win the grant, you get to do all this work and everything, uh, what kind of maintenance is involved in supporting this effort afterwards and have you addressed that or you know, a lot of people get wrapped up in the fact that 
oh, it's a grant, you know, and it's going to allow us to do this, but there's always this hangover afterwards of, of how you're going to support, support it moving forward. Chris, I love that question because actually in my other volunteer role, I'm on board of Regents for a school that teaches maintenance management, park and recreation, and we talk about that exact subject. And I think if you look at this project and what we've proposed so far, there's already, I think I said, there's 3,300 linear feet of trail out, out mm -hmm. that we identified as possibly being needed. There's already 3,300 linear feet of trail out there that's being roughly maintained by, and I, I don't mean roughly as, as a derogatory statement, it's, they're, they're maintained within their capacity by the disc golf organization. They are trails that have been, at, been created ad hoc, they're maintained as the best they can. The goal is to take this grant money and improve that system to a point where it would be easier for them to maintain it. And so they're already made, they're, there's already a trail system out there. This is going to f hopefully fix it. It would, and also, it would uh, also set some standards yeah. because now you have volunteers putting things on town property in good faith, but they're not being built or designed to a particular standard. And so there's possible more grant money that you can seek. VOREC has, this is a recurring grant. The right now it's got a lot of money in it. I don't know, 10 years from now it will, but I, I think we're at a crucial point where you, you need to plan, you need standards, and, and just not have volunteers building things and doing things. To be I, mean, I, love, I, I love seeing stuff like this. It's just that, you know, my concern is that it's going to fall back onto the taxpayers later on. And if there's a possibility of some form of revenue source, either through uh, not necessarily donations, but is there any fees that could be charged for possible well, that, I think that or? could be something that could be looked at in the planning process for the activities that are out there, especially possibly so many people using the facility for things like this golf. But looking at the pure formula we have now, Chris, the, the no fee for disc golf, the fact that we have volunteers maintaining the trails, if we if we fix this trail system and 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 and, and possibly identify other uh, volunteer groups who want to help too, but disc golf has been shown to be willing to do work out there, whether 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 everyone likes it or not, they've been shown willing to do that work. We, we've been working with them to try to get them to organize. We have a draft agreement, like loose agreement, kind of like what Skip talked about with the 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 dog park folks. We've been trying to push towards this more formalized agreement with them so that they are responsible for the maintenance, so it doesn't fall on town, the town folks. But by taking this grant money and investing in basically a capital investment to create a system that's going to be easier to maintain, that will result in a better used system that shouldn't be any more, shouldn't cost the town any more money to maintain. The ADA trails in the front country, that's a new, that's a new amenity. But I'm going to I'm going to uh, essentially say that that's something the town should be doing anyway. Um, that that's a that's a, 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 a accessibility uh, between the amenities uh, of the of a, t of a public of a public entity is a Title 20 is a Title II requirement of the ADA, and that's something we should be doing anyway. So there is no revenue recovery for that, and I'm going to be point blank with you. But the whole idea is to maintain and construct them properly so they take less maintenance. I mean, it's, it's, it's good to get people to do the physical work, but if there's any, like, structures that have to be replaced, there, there needs to be revenues in place to, to pay for those products to, you know, then allow the people to put them in, you know, to yeah, do the repair. Uh, I think, as Jane said, uh, revenue possibilities would be a conversation in the long-range planning process. And I would invite the board to participate in that. Well, it's good to see that you might be able to get a handle on a long time uh, this is our issue. Best, this is our best chance. This is really <laughs> a good chance. Do, um, is there a concern on other groups in Waterbury like this skate park group applying under the Waterbury address? I'm just wondering if competition obviously is high in this because there is no match. Um, I know I, I mentioned this to Nick and he had mentioned the skate park group, and I thought there was another one he mentioned. I just didn't know if you were aware of any other groups that were looking to apply and what they were applying for. Obviously, I'd like to see. I don't know. No, that's the only other one, Mark. And I think uh, that's the benefit of this preliminary application process is that's the kind of feedback that they'll probably provide. That well, uh, 
Sorry, folks, we're only going to look at one application from your community, and that may be feedback that we get, it's, and it may not. We don't know yet. So um, I think we'll, when we come back to you, we'll have more information about, about that. So tonight you're looking for, an, is there a signature involved or just uh, a blessing or what do we need? What do you yeah, need I think just us? a motion to um, authorize the, um, there's no real signature. It's in an electronic it. form. It's electronic it's form, so we to authorize the town of Waterbury to submit a uh, letter of intent for the uh, VORAC grant for the Hope Davy Parks Master Plan for these upgrades and improvements. I think that's more or less what we're looking for for a, a motion. Anybody want to move that motion? Go on. There's a second. Second. Any further discussion? Second. Second. Chris and Katie. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, did Danny ever hand up? On no. Okay. Uh, all those <laughs> favors, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, thank you. Aye. I want. I want to. Uh, you mentioned the skate park and the recreation committee earlier on, and I just wanted to clarify. I went back and rummaged through the minutes to find out exactly what we talked about with the skate park, and they did come talk to the recreation committee, and we did not take any action on either recommending or or. But we, we did express concerns about ongoing maintenance care of the facility. Um, of the current one or the future or both? Say again? Current, future, or both? Uh, future. Okay. Future skate park, sorry. Um, the, the, the fundraising plan. Um, and so we had planned to engage with them again in July, August, and uh, we got focused on this and lost bandwidth. Okay. So we intend to engage with them again. It's an odd situation because they're proposing to build on EFUD land. Which it might become our land. <laughs> you know, and then the recreation committee is really a town thing. So yeah. uh, we've okay. kind of walked in a little bit of line there. So but we stand ready to jump in and the lessons learned from disc golf and Hope Davy can apply there. Okay. No, this is exciting. I think this is exactly the direction we need to be going with Hope Davy and hopefully we come out with a, a better, more Less conflicty area. <laughs> All right. Good, thanks. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thank Mike. you very much. Mike, did, I get that? did you guys sign that air solutions letter? Thank you. Um, moving on. Stowe Street Bridge alternative. You got to sign it too, Mike. I know. Thank you. Thanks. Please. Did you want to sign that too? <laughs> So I think um, on this one, it's from the a meeting that the presentation was at on the bridge alternatives. We had some options and we needed to get back to them on a certain time frame. Yeah, the sooner the better. Uh, so uh, we did meet with folks from v Trans at the last meeting on August 2nd, uh, where they presented the uh, Bridge 36 over Thatcher Brook project. And uh, staff's recommendation after that meeting, uh, talking beforehand with Bill Woodruff, Alec Tuscany, and Steve, uh, and Bob Farr as well. Uh, staff's recommendation is that the select board support what the VTRANS proposal was. They offered several alternatives, uh, but they they suggested that alternative 3A, the full bridge replacement with the buried structure, traffic maintained on an off-site detour for a 60-day closure period, uh, was the recommended, was, you know, from their perspective, was the best alternative. Uh, they were asking, you know, do you want the temporary bridge? I think they made a pretty compelling case that the temporary bridge would be very expensive, required uh, right of way acquisition, um, and if you did that, you would lose some of the incentives that you get from this pro from this project. So, um, what I would recommend is that uh, you folks sign this 
that would check off the alternative 3A, which is that full bridge replacement that I just talked about, and that the select board agrees that the bridge will be closed during the duration of the project, uh, that no temporary pedestrian or vehicle bridge will be required, uh, the town will be responsible for signing and maintaining the detours, uh, and then, uh, you know, whoever is here in the 2024-2025 time frame will have to make a decision about whether you're going to do something for pedestrians in terms of busing. I, I think that's overkill right now. I, I certainly, if it was going to be next year, I wouldn't recommend that we do that. But, um, <coughs> That's really what our recommendation is, is to allow us to check off this alternative with this um, caveat that there's no, no temporary bridge and no, um, no provision for pedestrian or vehicle uh, access. And that was for the 3.4 million? Is that a um, tag there? Yeah, I don't have that number in front of me, Chris. But I believe that's I believe that's the case. And that was the, the one that is a freeform concrete arches with basically dirt construction similar to a regular roadway on top of it. Just like a concrete culvert basically. Yeah, right. big culvert. Right. The very structure. <coughs> so uh, we get the highest uh, the highest benefit from the the state will will pay the the highest percentage of the costs if we choose this. So if that's something that you're in agreement with, I think you can just make a motion to approve the uh, the alternative three A that was presented by the trans on August second. Any discussion? I mean, my, my biggest yeah. gripe with the whole thing was just saying that you could do a pedestrian temporary bridge, but it's going to cost you three hundred thousand. So much more money, but it's it's your option. It's like no, you really put us against the wall on this because, you know, obviously that kind of spending doesn't seem to make sense. But I do feel for anyone who does walk on that path, which I know there are plenty of people that potentially do that we're not aware of. But I see them walking. I know that one guy works at Shaw's. I've not been like so I feel for that scenario and I hope that we as a town or maybe we can work with our W find solutions for the pedestrian scenario but um, I really do feel like the state I don't, I don't know what I mean just even presenting that a detour walk route was up Perry Hill down was just like I don't know it's kind of upsetting to me but um, I agree, Mark, it kind of made us feel like we had a choice and then it looked like the select board's choice to take that away from from town members, but really it, it wasn't actually a viable option at any point. So that that was a only frustrating thing to me too. So glad you said it. So. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments, but I think it sounds like staff's recommendation. I don't think anyone ever said they thought we should do a different no. bridge. That was more proposal. <laughs> my concern too. I was a little bit concerned about pedestrian, you know, people who use as a pedestrian, but in the scheme of things, a short term, you know, can we work to have some sort of public transit around there, you know, through Green Mountain, you know. Or volunteer on call. Well, well, right, exactly. The, the, the unfortunate problem is, and this is, I know Chris will appreciate what I say here, is that, um, okay, you, you need additional right away if you're going to put a temporary bridge up. Right, so you're going, to, you're going to get some rights from private property owners. Okay, so you, you can deal with that. Uh, I think even I could build a bridge that was safe across there that you could have pedestrians walk across that, that you could do it for, you know, a couple thousand dollars. But the way the standards are and what you need to do, oh, and the yeah. fact that there's no sidewalk up on Route 100, that's the, the sky falls in. It doesn't matter that people are walking across the sidewalk to nowhere now. If you put a new bridge down <coughs> that goes to nowhere, they freak out about it. So yeah. the standard that they have is going to cost $300,000 to build a bridge that 
you know, you can put a log across there. Most people well, but it also wasn't across. the cost. It was that if you choose this option, the five percent change just to ten percent or whatever. So it wasn't right. it wasn't just the cost of that. It was also like we really don't want you to choose this, and we're going to penalize you if you do. And like that really hurt me. Yeah, I you know I hate to say it, but we're if you think about it, we live in, in a pretty blessed country, right? We're so blessed that we've gotten to the point where we're pretty spoiled. To me, a 60-day inconvenience to have a brand new bridge that will accommodate walkers and you know hikers sure. and bikers afterwards. Right. Is I just it, think we have, to be aware. Ask, you know? we have to be aware of Tom. There are people that can't afford cars that are using that bridge currently to get to, to and from work. Yeah, I think or, it's worth looking at so. some type of a shuttle. You know, my, uh, my wife said, use the damn wreck bus, right? To, you, you could put that in service. That's a good idea. Bit. But I, the reason I asked you about the three and a half million because <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, after that presentation, I walked away from it and I said, three and a half million dollars in 60 days, that's a pretty good rate of pay. Uh, and it just, it, you know, it goes back to our conversation earlier, it just got my blood boiling, how things have been orchestrated throughout the system, government system that have just driven costs so high that it's, you know, impacted people who were, you know, now telling me that they have to leave, or, and that, that's just one of many that, that, you know, are struggling with the affordability aspect, and, uh, and I, you know, and then I'm hearing stuff about what's going on here in the village <coughs> with the project here. I see them jackhammering out concrete, and I'm seeing seven people standing around watching a one-man work, and I'm just, that this stuff like that doesn't, it just rubs me the wrong way. You know, you have to forgive me, but. So it's 5% of that three and a half is what we're thinking it is for our yeah. cost. So it's 175,000 is the quick math on that. So we just have, obviously we're years out from that, but we have to take that into account that that will have to be in our budget. Yeah. Okay, um, motion. I make a motion to approve uh, option 3C, is it? 3A. 3A. Almost got a different bridge. <laughs> second. <laughs> All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, uh, please say. Just going to oh, say, but, uh, have they given you any better timeline on it? I mean, we're talking, what, 2024, 2025? What the hell? 2024 seems like the earliest right now. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I think it's for 2025 and it could move up a little bit but now does this lock in that price no i was going to say for that guys it locks in the percentage yeah okay uh, it'll, have, it'll have to be bid so anyway you've got to you know bid, that uh, chris <laughs> so i can wait it's the sign down below there's no plywood plug it's for something yeah uh, no, no price is definite. Yeah, the other sheet. Until the oh. contract oh, signed. Sorry, it's been moved and seconded. Uh. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right, last item on the agenda is the racial equity training conversation. Yeah, so at the last meeting, I passed out to you. I believe the uh, summary and the next steps that Mayor Glenn had recommended. Um, and the question is, you know, do you want to go through and have one more session with her? Uh, as I said the last time, uh, the last two times, um, you know, she she had kind of an agenda, and especially the first time, she dealt with a lot of the things that we were dealing with here. And, um, she kind of turned a little bit into a counselor, if you will, uh, and just you know talked about some of the struggles that you folks were having and some of the issues that you're facing. Um, I told her that from my point of view, that if we were going to do one more, that we should try to do a better job to allow her to get through her
presentation. So uh, that's it's the board's choice. You know, you, you've com you committed to the training. You've had two sessions. Uh, whether you think you want more or not is, is your choice. But if you do go forward, I think sticking to some of her educational materials and her more standard presentations will likely. Uh, What's the cost on that? Just so, minus. Uh, it's about 1400 I think. Plus lodging. No, I don't need it all together. Okay. I have no problem with doing because I know she wanted to get to and I think it was good. It was a little bit of a counseling session, but I think some of that was very helpful. But I think some of the nuts and bolts wouldn't hurt us. I don't have a problem with it either if we could stick to the agenda and right. get through our whole slideshow presentation. I think that would be a plus. And I think it's important that the community as a whole recognizes that this is still ongoing and we are making a conscious effort and it's still part of our, you know, itinerary to keep doing this. And yeah, there, I mean, there's some expectation or possibility. I mean, she talked about, and she even included it here, that ongoing, this might be something that you ultimately want to invite community members in and have some more of a public presentation and public engagement as opposed to, you know, these private sessions. It's not necessary, of course. And, um, you know, since the board has undertaken this, these two sessions with Mary, there's been much less public input. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know where we are with the public on this uh, issue, whether they, they're thinking that you need to do uh, a lot more to include them, but uh, it's the board's call, so uh, we have to make a decision. On a, on a macro level, money is not a, an issue. At the last meeting, I explained to you that I think we're going to have a significant surplus at the end of the year just because we were so conservative in our estimates with payments from the state. I think we're going to be in a good position going into next year. So on that macro level, it does not, this is not a financial issue. On a micro level, you know, you've already spent uh, several thousand dollars on the two sessions that you've had. Um, do you feel it's worth it? Do you, are you getting anything out of it? And, and that's, you know, it's, it's your call at this point. So it's, it's not going to hurt on a budgetary global basis, but do you feel that there's value to it um, for another session is really the question that you have to answer. I mean, I'll, I'll chime in and say that I, I absolutely think it's worth it. I think it's a small investment. There's board members that are going to continue on next year, and it's setting the tone for where we are as a board and how we interact with the community. And I think we haven't, I think the sessions we've had have been very good, but obviously we've gone on tangents, and I think getting through this and understanding the core of the education that's trying to be presented and moving that forward into the following years, I think is really important. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm not surprised that we, we, how our sessions have gone, but I think they've been very good and I think we've learned a lot about each other. And, and I think at this point, hopefully through education will also just help address some of the other issues of just the communication and the, the, the core of the, the issues at hand. So I think it's worth one more. Danny keeps turning your microphone off and on. Danny, are you trying to jump in? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of for a third. I think we think of it as kind of getting the 
bigger conversations that we needed to have under our feet and then moving forward with, like you said, more of the festivals and education and then, you know, setting the tone as we go forward. We also started a couple of processes and ideas that I think would be helpful to finish and get some more concrete, um, you know, steps on moving forward and how to incorporate the things that we'll be but into the way that we you know it's just the town, the betterment of the way that the select board operates and into um, you know the way that we work for the town. So so I, you know it's, yes it's spending money but it's certainly an investment. So um, I think that's that's helpful. Um, did we have a proposed date or um, timeline? I can't remember. No, we don't. I'll work with Mary. If, if the board decides they want to do it, I'll work with Mary and come up with a date. I mean, she's been willing to do it on select board meeting nights. Um, I'm sure we can find a, a time, but uh, nothing is scheduled yet, Danny, because I didn't know yet whether or not the board wanted to do more. So. Um. Um, do we need a motion for this, or is it more of just... No, I, I think, I think the, consensus is, the consensus seems to be to have a third session. Um, I think we could pay for it by raising the temperature in here a couple of degrees. It's really hot in here before you get here. It's been cold the last few meetings. Um, one thing, Mark, um, are you done with this topic? Are we done with this topic? During the discussion about the municipal manager's compensation, you made a suggestion that the board approve paying for oh. salaried employees that took a free free town. Well, you're in, I think they already agreed to that. I don't think oh, we so actually did. Motion? We, we didn't make a motion, or I don't know if you, but I don't know if we actually did specifically do that. I but think the consensus was there, and I think it's Bill's. Okay. You know, Bill pays. The, co the conversation that went on, right. I got the sense that that was okay. If you want to specifically make a motion, you can't. But uh, I thought what I heard was that you were supportive of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think it's it's fair, and I appreciate anyone who offered mm -hmm. to take a pay cut, not knowing what we were headed into. But obviously, as you pointed out, we are financially, as a town, doing all right, and I and. I think that those employees deserve the money that they had given up. And like you said, they continue to work and they would have probably done better if they didn't. Right. Anyone else not feel like we should? We don't need a motion on it, do we? I don't think so. Let's move forward. I think that's it. Yep. The only FYI is I'll probably be virtual on the seventh. Uh, I have to do some stuff with my stepmom out of town, but I'll be able to be on. on the this is this Sixth. That was the so it's a Tuesday it's meeting. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. On Tuesday. Yeah. Yep. So next meeting is on. Tuesday, September 7th. So you'll be virtual on that day? Anyway? Yeah. All right, so I won't, I won't schedule the training for that day. No, please don't. <laughs> and I'll don't want to miss it, don't I? I think it's important. I, you know, I'm all, for, I'm all for the training. I've been through a lot of diversity and inclusion trainings you know, with the federal government. And I think it's really important it's us as leaders to show, you know, why it is important and how we do value, you know, diversity, inclusion, you know, anti-racism. Personal thing. Motion okay. to adjourn. So move. Oh, I, I was okay. I was looking for it. Oh, oh yeah. Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Bye, Danny. Bye, Danny. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.